Good afternoon, everyone. We will be starting our conversation with Mrs. Hager here just momentarily. Get ready, get a sip to drink, and, and let's just enjoy our, our afternoon together. Tamak is visiting with the candidates of the United States Senate, a statewide election. The Honorable John Cornyn, Republican candidate and incumbent Mary M.J. Hager, Democratic candidate, were both invited to have a conversation with you. Texas businesses and community leaders across the state who have real concerns and real issues that we face every day. First, I would like to introduce Samuel Guzman, Chairman of the Board, to say a few words. Mr. Guzman? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are uh, having uh, these kind of meetings, if you will, uh, as long as we have to. We used to meet, obviously, in person, and we used to have some of the best uh, sessions that we, that we had uh, for many years. Uh, this, this organization is 45 years old, and we've been doing it every year. Now we're doing it the way we need to do it, and it's being effective. We just came off a, a webinar with Dr. Fauci, which attend, uh, attracted more than 1,000 participants throughout the nation. So we're going to continue uh, to have these. We want to thank every one of you for joining us. As, uh, as our president said, this is for the purpose of informing you, bringing, bringing about the best information we can with what's important to all of us uh, nowadays. And uh, we're real pleased to have uh, the candidate for the Senate. We have two senators, as everybody knows. Uh, she is running for one of the Senate seats, and we've invited uh, Senator Cornyn as well. Uh, and uh, we're real, real pleased that uh, MJ Hagar, Hagar was able to join us today. But first of all, let me say, uh, before, I, before I say anything else, that uh, I personally, and I think everybody joins me in thanking uh, MJ Hagar for her service to this country. Uh, she put her, not only her name on the line, her life on the line, and we're real, real, real thankful for that, absolutely. And, uh, you know, everybody's talking about that these elections at a national level, at the, uh, at the state level, and at the local level, or, or uh, some of the most important elections they have ever had in their lives. And the reason they're saying that is because that's a fact. And so that's why we're bringing you uh, these kind of, of conversations uh, so that uh, we can learn and then make up our own minds in terms of what we want to do with regard to uh, making our communities the best possible that we can. So without further ado, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guzman. We greatly appreciate your leadership, especially during these difficult times. Bach is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse any candidates nor a political party. However, as leaders and a trusted voice in your community, it is important for you to be well informed on all candidates. This week, we are having a conversation with MJ Hagar, the Democratic candidate. Mrs. Hagar will first have an opportunity to tell us about herself, then our moderators, Taina Maya, Tamak Woman of Distinction recipient from Waco, Texas, and J.R. Gonzalez, Tumac Executive Vice Chair, will briefly introduce themselves prior to asking questions. If you have a question, at the bottom of your screen is an icon that says Q&A. Please feel free to send in your question. We are, going to get to as, we are going to get as many answered as possible. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hagar. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of our membership and Hispanic businesses in Texas, we appreciate you sharing your time. We also appreciate your service in the military. Please take this opportunity to tell us who you are. The MJ Hagger story. <laughs> elected, how would you represent Texas? Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pauline. I really appreciate y'all taking the time uh, to have me on today. And for those tuning in, I know there are so many other things you could be doing with your time right now. Everybody has very full plates. I may get an unintended cameo from my kiddos as we struggle through, <laughs> you know, virtual kindergarten and things like that. So I apologize in advance if that happens. But um, 
Thank you for not taking your eye off the ball here because despite the challenges as we're going through, we can rise to those challenges, but we can't do it if we don't have the right people in a position to make the change that, that's needed um, and, and course correct us and, and protect small businesses instead of just the wealthy special interests. But for those of you who don't know me, I grew up here in Texas. I spent uh, 12 years in the military, five working in healthcare and two in tech. Um, I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin and then I also got an executive MBA from there. And um, I'm running for the US Senate because I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution when I put on the uniform. And I see this as a fulfillment of that oath. I do see um, a threat to our Constitution and some of the things that this administration is doing. Um, but also my, my personal selfish reasons for running for office are that I do have two small kids. Um, one that just turned six, I, I used to say three and five, just turned six, so three and six, and he just lost his first tooth. So if he storms in here, I'll make sure to have him show you. Um, but you know, I'm trying to protect the world that they're growing up into and that all of our kids are growing up into. And I want them to have a place, I want them to have a country that, that you know, I believed was our country growing up, that, that was a place of opportunity, that, that were the leaders of the free world and deserved that mantle. And, and that's what I'm fighting for. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I look at DC, I, I just, I don't see a whole lot of Texas values reflected back. Uh, I see a lot of people putting their own self-interest and the profits of their donors above our country and our constitution. And, and I don't see things like independence and grit and integrity and backbone. Um, you know, John Cornyn is certainly guilty of this. Who, who he, he's, been in, in, he's been in the Senate for 18 years and has consistently sold us out while promising to do things like um, support immigration reform and protect dreamers. He's consistently voted against that. And, and I think the fact that he says things like, I'm going to protect pre-existing condition and, and have a pathway to citizenship and close the, the gun show loophole, when he says things like that, he's identifying that he knows that that's what we want. And I don't understand why if he knows that's what we want, he doesn't do it. Um, during the pandemic, he's completely failed us. He, he has blocked relief. He is uh, jamming through a Supreme Court nomination instead of showing urgency around COVID relief. Um, you know, Mitch McConnell recently said, we're gonna wait until after the election to, to look at COVID relief. And, and, and I feel like there's not enough people in DC who understand that rent is due and, and, and mortgage is due on the first <laughs> and that we can't wait until it's politically convenient for them to, to, to deliver um, on that relief. So, you know, this election, we have an opportunity to change all of that by taking out as many people who are more DC than they are Texas and replacing them with real Texans who will fight for us. I will fight like hell for Texas workers and small businesses. As we recover from the economic hardships and the public health crisis that have been exacerbated by the fumbled handling of this pandemic, but we're also set up to fail by the already broken immigration and, and um, healthcare systems that we had in, in Texas and, and across the, the country. Um, I will fight like hell for Texans to have access to quality, affordable healthcare. I worked in healthcare for five years and, and I think that, that we can do that, um, that the current model is it costs, it, it makes sky high costs, it's inefficient. We're having to spread the cost across the nearly third of working age Texans who don't have insurance. We're having to spread that cross across. And that's why, you know, a tablet of ibuprofen is $50 when you go into the ER because you're paying for everyone else that came through who didn't have insurance. Um, so it's not only the right thing to do to get people access to healthcare, especially in the middle of a pandemic, but it's also the strategic and smart and economic thing to do. I'll, I'll fight like hell to have access um, to, uh, to, to take aggressive action on climate change, to have comprehensive immigration reform, to, to take action on the gun violence epidemic. The bottom line is that there are very powerful people trying to stop us, but I believe that we are stronger than they are because there are more of us than there are of them. But it takes standing up together and fighting for a, a unified Texas and a stronger Texas and I can't do this without y'all. So um, let's try to just put politics aside, build broad coalitions, focus on the mission instead of pointing fingers and, and playing politics and, and really come up with some real pragmatic um, solutions to the challenges that we're facing. Thank you so much. MJ, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we want to just we wanna open this conversation and really continue it. So you mentioned and you briefly touched on, you know, small businesses. Of course, Hispanics making up 74% of our Hispanic population across America. Then when we look at Texas having one of the highest population rates of Hispanics across back at home for you and for me as well, really it's a question of 
how do you plan to ensure that we are helping our small business owners who are Hispanic minorities, more than likely, and then also making sure that they can survive if they're forced to pay their employees more of a salary than the current market value? I think that is a huge question. A lot of our young business owners and entrepreneurs, especially minority owned, are looking for guidance and just clarity on where you stand on those positions. You know, um, I have always been an advocate for small business. I, I think that the, um, that if we ran our businesses the way that the government runs the government, we would be out of, we would be out of business, right? Um, I think that the lack of, of real objective metrics and, and science-based and numbers-based and, and um, um, model-based uh, leadership is really concerning. I think we have to listen to scientists and medical experts. The best thing we can do for small businesses is get the public health side of this under control so that we can open safely. There's consumer confidence with people patronizing businesses. Um, we need a secure relief that has expired under Cornyn's watch with, you know, six months of the Senate not acting, things like expanded unemployment insurance, um, securing financial assistance for struggling small businesses. Did y'all know that 90% of minority owned businesses were left completely out of the PPP program, were, program, were not able to get the, the help that they needed. And a lot of that work, a lot of that support went to bigger businesses or, um, you know, white owned businesses that had networks with accountants and attorneys already in place. There was a lot of nepotism. There was a lot of fraud. There was a lot of um, relief going to large farms, for example, and not the smaller family farms. So, you know, we have to take action to help small businesses. And, and I believe when balancing that with the need to raise the living wage, there's not enough talk, by the way, about lowering the cost of living in addition to that. I think that, yes, we do need to raise um, the minimum wage, but we need to do it in a way that we're working with small businesses and we need to be using the carrot and not the stick and enforcing things, but incentivizing things through tax credits and, and other help. Um, you know, I used to be a bartender. I've waited tables. I understand what will happen to small businesses under sometimes well-intended, you know, pushes for a, an immediate $15 minimum wage, for example. I know that that would kill a lot of small businesses, but we do also have to provide people with a living wage and we have to lower the cost of living and cost of housing. Um, but again, I don't think that we can do that just across the board without involving Chamber of Commerces and small business owners and talking about how, how do we get there. Ms. Hager, J.R. Gonzalez here. Thank you once again so much for joining us. And as uh, Mr. Guzman said, uh, thank you for your service. As I was reading your website, we were also talking about the importance of affordable living wage. Mm -hmm. And you touched on it here a second ago. I just want you, if you don't mind, expand on it a little bit. How are you going to raise a minimum wage when some of these smaller businesses are struggling just to stay open? Because if wages are going to go up, employee cost is going to go up, and that's going to take away from the bottom line of these small businesses. And yeah. if you look at it, Texas is a big state, as is the country. So the cost of living in oh, hundred percent in in, in 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 Pecos, Texas, is going to be a lot different than Austin, Texas. So mm -hmm. a blanket. Um, wage increase across the board is going to be devastating for a lot of small businesses. I'm with you. I'm with you exactly. Um, I often talk about, and I touched on it just now, the unintended consequences of well-intended legislation, right? Um, it doesn't help to increase the minimum wage if it means it puts a bunch of small businesses out of business and then they can't provide those jobs in the first place, right? Um, I think that we need people in office who have faced the challenges of regular everyday people like us because we bring the right experiences and the right voices to the conversation. And those voices must be heard if we are to identify unintended consequences, things like changes in cost of living from you know, different, parts of the, different parts of the state. Um, I would also add to that, there is a big push in the bartending and, and um, food service and wait, waiting tables kind of industry, the service industry, that if we do raise wages, it's actually gonna cause us to earn less because we're a tip-based pay right now. And, and when John Cornyn says things like, un, uh, un, he says expanded unemployment insurance motivates people not to go to work because 80% of the people who are on that are making more than they were at their jobs. I think he doesn't understand that people make more than what's in their paycheck when they're being tipped or when they're um, relying on overtime or picking up extra shifts just to keep food on the table. Like he just, he hasn't worked in these types of jobs before, right? 
Um, so the way that I think that we move forward, because we do need to make sure that we're offering a living wage, right? I don't think that in the middle of an economic crisis when small businesses are shuttering is the time to be doing that. Um, I think that what should be happening right now is that the government that we have spent so much on in taxes, we are overburdened with taxes, especially in the middle and lower middle class, um, and especially with small businesses. I mean, if Amazon isn't paying anything in taxes, does that sound right to anybody? I mean, I know a, a lot of small business owners and a lot of um, people and families like myself just spending tens of thousands of dollars in taxes every year, if not more. So I think that Amazon should be paying their fair share. I mean, I, I'm not here to um, penalize somebody for being successful. I don't want to punish people for being wealthy. I do think people should be paying their fair share. And if people are paying their fair share and we walk back the um, atrocious tax reform that was painted as a middle-class miracle uh, from 2017, now, I don't want to raise taxes on the middle class, uh, but, but Senator Cornyn and his allies were given an opportunity to decide which tax cuts were going to be permanent, middle class families or large scale corporations, and they chose large scale corporations. And, and that should tell you where their priorities are and who they're fighting for. They're not fighting for us. Um, so we need to have a, a tax code where people are paying their fair share, and we need to be supporting with those taxes our country that's in an economic crisis right now because our, our, our elected officials politicized our health and, and fumbled the public health aspect of this pandemic. So while we need people to make better decisions on the public health side, we need to focus our economic recovery on small businesses and on the middle class because we are the backbone of this economy, not the CEOs and the wealthy uh, special interests. So on that note, can I ask if you were currently a senator, how would you be better spending or how would you design the COVID relief bill to be able to provide what you're right now describing to not only the middle class, but to the Hispanics and the small business owners? Because uh, like you said, tip based or not, there still has to be some funding uh, from the government that's going to be able to subsidize. So how long would you keep that going and what does that look like for you? Uh, my top economic priority for recovering from this economic crisis is to get the pandemic under control. I, I, I don't see, I am, I am a fiscally responsible person, <laughs> you know, um, I, my leadership style is in, in, in being fiscally responsible and I don't think that necessarily throwing money at a problem is the answer. Um, I do think that there are times when we need to invest in, in fixing problems and right now is one of those times. Um, I don't see a lot of transparency and accountability on where that money is going. I don't see a lot of people, um, I mean, I don't have the answer for how those minority owned businesses were left out of PPP, you know, programs and how we can fix that. There needs to be a fix for that though. And if I was in charge, I would roll up my sleeves and get to work and I would be partnering with organizations like y'all's and figuring out how to do that. Um, because it wasn't, you know, that I, I keep saying it's not, systemic racism is not one guy twisting his mustache approving PPP applications and saying, no, I'm a racist. I'm not going to approve this one for this minority owned business. It's a, it's a systemic thing. And it's the, like I said, the relationships with the lawyers and the accountants and the um, networks and the alumni associations and all of that type of thing. So we really just need to do a better job of figuring out who needs this help and getting that help to them quickly. Um, I think it was good that the Democrats wrote in things like making sure that the PPP loans were used for paychecks instead of stock dividends and, and CEO bonuses and things like that. I think that there have been some bailouts in the past where that money has not been spent well. Um, so oversight, accountability, transparency, things like that. Um, but certainly the priority has to be get the pandemic under control. And in April, when Texas was looking at, uh, Governor Abbott was talking about letting things expire, letting mask mandates and stay at home orders and things like that expire. I was starting to try to like raise the red flags and say, no, 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 hang on a second. I know you think you're helping the economy, but you're killing small businesses if you do this. If we stumble through opening and the pandemic and we don't get it under control with testing and PPE and contact tracing and all the things that other countries that have handled this pandemic better have done, we're going to kill small businesses because they can't last for a year while they wait for the pandemic to get under control and their customers to come back. So the public health aspect of this has to be the top economic priority too. Ma'am, I have a two-part two question here. I'm listening to what you're saying that we need to get the pandemic under control. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the different things, it, not only the additional PPE and the testing, but are you also advocating or is, if we need to go into a lockdown, would you support 
going into a stay in place uh, condition again. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? And how's that gonna affect the economy? And basically a lot of, a lot of any, anybody's popularity when it comes to saying we need to shut down again. Well, first of all, I don't think we should be taking into consideration popularity. And, and that's kind of um, you know hard to say to people who live and die on elections. Um, this is why I think we need term limits. I don't think your whole career should be in politics. I think you should step away from your career, serve your community, and then go back to your life when your time is done. So. Um, we need to be making fewer decisions based on polling and what's popular and more decisions based on what's effective. Now, um, I think if we had, you know, shut down in certain places that were hot spots more effectively, then we could have handled this pandemic better. Um, I am a beware of government overreach person. I am a local control of government, especially, you know, as to the greatest extent possible, as long as that local government isn't infringing on civil liberties, okay? Things like you know, segregating diners and things like that. Obviously, we can't leave to local control of government, all right? But I do think that local elected officials and local public health officials more than elected officials um, have a better grasp on what needs to happen in their local area. So I'm not for things like national mandates and national this and national that, because as you said, you know, parts of Texas are very different than other parts and some places maybe don't need to go into lockdown or have a mask mandate if, if they're a smaller town and they're spread out and they don't have any cases and things like that. What I am for is a national strategy. Um, and I think that that strategy, look, when I, when I was in the military and in healthcare, um, I was trained extensively in crisis management. And in crisis management, the number one thing you have to do is remove the human error, remove the human subjectivity, remove the um, desire to protect your career or CYA or anything like that, okay? And, and I would have been much more comfortable and I think we would have been way better off um, with a metrics, an objective metrics, science-driven model. So in healthcare, for example, when ICU beds are 75% full, we go into code orange. That's not an objective thing where you get to decide if we're in code orange. In code orange, these 12 actions kick in and that's not under uh, up for debate. We just do those things. That prevents a hospital CEO from being like, oh, if we go into code orange, that makes, makes me look bad. And am I still going to be the hospital CEO next year? That's what I would like to see more of. People centering the mission People saying, well, we have to get this pandemic under control. What are the best practices in other countries? What can we do? And then have the political and intestinal fortitude to do the right thing, regardless of what the polls are telling us. A follow-up to that, you said a little while ago that you, and we, all, we know, we're, we're totally aware of how little money actually came to small and minority-owned businesses. You said 90%. I'd like to think it's probably even more. We did not receive our fair share. Yes. So with that said, what would you do or what do you propose to make sure that small businesses did get their fair share if, in fact, there's another stimulus round? Well, I'm a root cause person. Uh, I need access to the system by which they sent out that money, and I don't have that access now. If I did, as a sitting senator, I would go through that, uh, probably not alone, because I you know, can't solve all of you. I'm, I'm a rare um, person running for office that I don't have the ego that thinks that I can <laughs> solve the world's problems by myself. I would bring people like you, JR, uh, in and, and say, you know, let's look at the process. How did this go? How were the decisions made? What was, this, what was the bar? What was the application process? What kind of resources did we have for small businesses and specifically minority owned small businesses that may not have those relationships with attorneys and things like that? What was the process to give people the resources to understand how to apply? for PPP loans and, and understand. Um, I've talked to small business owners across the state, um, many minority owned small business owners who were talking about how um, the last thing they wanted to do was take a PPP loan because they didn't want to be more, like they didn't think they could pay it back. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain that there were stipulations under which it wouldn't have to be paid back and it was news to them. So, you know, we need to put resources in place to provide to um, chambers of commerce and to provide to small business owners to understand what these relief packages mean, how to apply for them, how to successfully get approved for them, and then go into the process and see where is the breakdown in the process that's, that's causing this problem. I'm going to move really quickly. I know you've mentioned several times that you have a background in healthcare crisis management, uh, removing that human error is what you said just a moment ago. Uh, access to healthcare for Latinos and Hispanics is something that is a real 
concern for families. Even the ability to go to see the doctor sometimes is not always efforted across all of the races equally. And so that's a concern. Where do you see a plan for healthcare in Texas really taking a turn when you look at what you're describing as your background of a nuts and bolts, here's what we do framework, and how it's kind of played out? Um, this doesn't seem to match, and I'm not quite connecting the dots, so I'd love to know how your you know, crisis management background and healthcare really would provide better and equal access for all to quality healthcare in this time. Well, we need to fix the healthcare model. Um, my, my crisis management experience would help me lead during a pandemic, but, but there, the, the, the challenges you're talking about that are very real challenges that were here before COVID, we need to fix the healthcare model. Um, so for right now, what that means, right this moment, it's protecting the Affordable Care Act as the best that we have, but we can improve on that. We can do better than the Affordable Care Act. But um, Texas, the entire time John Cornyn's been in office, the whole 18 years, Texas has been 50th out of the entire country in access to healthcare. Okay, that causes multiple things. One, it causes an unhealthy population. It causes a lot of underlying conditions, pre-existing conditions. Uh, it makes us more vulnerable to things like COVID. Um, it's an economic thing for sure that we could do 30 minutes on the economic implications of not having access to healthcare, not being able to work, but also being one accident or illness away from bankruptcy. But let me try to be succinct. <laughs> um, so, you know, the broken healthcare system is, um, when, when John Cornyn came into office, nearly one, and sometimes over, one out of four Texans didn't have access to health insurance. Then the Affordable Care Act came and it became a little better, one out of five, right? And then we didn't expand Medicaid because we have a Republican controlled state house. And I just want to throw in a pitch here to look down ballot and research your candidates that are down ballot and please um, understand that these races get a lot of the attention, but the lower down the ballot the race is, the bigger impact it actually has on your day-to-day -day life. So please research those down ballot candidates. And I think that we need to flip the house. And I think a big part of it is because they didn't expand Medicaid and there's voter suppression, but that's my pitch. Um, so the fact that we became one out of five people after the Affordable Care Act, and I was working in healthcare during the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and I had concerns. Um, but I got to see how the Affordable Care Act impacted patients and providers. And then I got pregnant with my first kiddo. And so then I was facing, I have a pre-existing condition growing in my belly. And then I was getting laid off on top of that. So all of a sudden, you know, we need to elect more people, by the way, who have worried about where they're going to get their health care from. Okay. Because I think that this is something a lot of elected officials don't understand. Um, I immediately started thinking back to when was I, when did I receive the best care? Now I received... Uh, military health care, which is what John Cornyn is trying to paint what Democrats want, this like single provider government run health care. I'm not advocating for that. And then I was on military TRICARE, which is different. Military TRICARE is like military Medicare. And that was the best care I ever had. And that's what I want for people. I want to fight for people to have access to Medicare. And that's why I am for a public option, which would do a lot of things. Um, you know, the employer provided model is a barrier to small business creation, a lot of times, not only do people go bankrupt because, or lose their businesses because they can't afford the healthcare costs for their employees, but they don't want to quit their salary job to start a small business because they're going to lose their own benefits. And so we just, we have to do more to get people. I think a public option is the answer to that. A, a public option also, it, it provides competition to the insurance market and it's gonna make the private insurance industry have to be better, have to be more efficient, have to be lower cost, have to serve their customers. There's a, there's a thought, let's hold that industry to the same standard that we're held to in small business. Um, and you know, but I, I also, having been under military healthcare with no choices, I will always fight like hell for Texans to be able to retain the ability to choose what access to healthcare means to them. Um, I was just in the Rio Grande Valley recently talking to a nurse who was expressing um, frustration because she had just come from a patient who was exhibiting COVID symptoms. And she said to her, you have to go get a COVID test. You live in a multi-generational house with 12 other people. You work in a frontline job. You interact with people all the time. You must go get a test as quickly as you can. And she said, absolutely. I understand. I'll do it as soon as I can. And she said, great. When can you do it? And she said, it's going to take me about two weeks to put together the $150 that it takes. Y'all, this, this allowing so many people to not have access to healthcare is not just a moral, morally repugnant situation. It, it is that. 
but it is also not good from a public health aspect. It's not good from an economic aspect because when people who don't have care go into the emergency room and seek care in the most expensive setting because they don't have access to a general practitioner who could provide preventative medicine, by the way, um, but they wait till it's an emergency situation, they go in with bronchial pneumonia instead of a cough that they could get antibiotics for, that is costing the healthcare networks so much money that they're having to increase our cost for things like a tablet of ibuprofen. So it's just not in anyone's best interest that so many people, one out of three now in Texas, one out of three age 18 to 65 don't have access to health insurance. We can do better, we must do better, but we can't feed people fear-mongering rhetoric um, just to please corporate donors from the, the healthcare industry. John Cornyn has received almost $2 million from them. That's why he is Affordable Care Act repeals top salesman. MJ, I hear you say a lot and I appreciate your enthusiasm. You're going to fight like hell. This is an issue like I'm hell, very right? passionate about. I'm sorry. Right. I could talk about healthcare all day. <laughs> no, and, and, and I'm glad. We could, I wish this was longer, but we're talking about healthcare. We have some other t topics we want to talk about. But you keep saying, I'm going to fight. You're going to fight for Texans. Mm -hmm. Your opponent is a senior member of the Senate. He's been yeah. there quite a while. He knows the do's and the don'ts and the ins and the outs. 100%. What makes, you, what makes you think that even though you have the passion to fight, that you even have the skill sets to make a change up in Washington? Because it doesn't matter if you're in a senior position if you don't use that position for your constituents. It doesn't matter how much power or ability or effectiveness he has. He's been very effective for his corporate donors. 18 years in the Senate, Texas has been 50th for access to health care. Six of those years, a third of John Cornyn's time in the Senate, he has had the, the White House, a majority in the House, and a majority in the Senate. If he wanted to get something done, he would have done it. And he has ads out right now talking about protecting pre-existing conditions, which tells me he knows Texans are demanding we protect pre-existing conditions. His ad and his plan to protect pre-existing conditions just received four Pinocchios. It has been fact-checked false. He is very effective at fighting for his very wealthy special interests and in corporate donors. I don't care if he is the king of the world, if he is gonna use that power to protect special interests instead of hardworking regular Texans, it doesn't matter. And I've already been to DC. As a private citizen, I went to DC, took time off my healthcare job to go and fight to open jobs for women in the military. And people like John Cornyn told me I wouldn't be able to do it because I wasn't an influential donor. I didn't have any political, um, what do they call it? Political capital. Uh, I didn't have a, 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 a quo to offer to their quid for the quid pro quo that's always demanded, but I was able to do it. And I was able to do it by talking to people about values and about why what I was fighting for would make our military and our country stronger. So I'm not just saying my gut tells me I'm gonna go be a fighter. I'm saying I have taken on very difficult challenges in the past and I have been successful every time. And it's because I have a strength of character and a moral clarity and a belief that I am fighting for our country. And I took a bullet in Afghanistan protecting our constitution. And that is my level of commitment to protecting this country and our constitution and my constituents. Thank you for sharing, MJ. I think that everyone feels your enthusiasm and passion, just like JR referenced. I do have two quick questions for you. Uh, one you mentioned early on that you're a mom. You've got a three-year-old and a new six-year-old. Education is a hot topic, not only talking about education, how it's completely shifted uh, throughout COVID, but then also funding for education in the upcoming legislative session. And beyond that, you know how we're really reforming how we educate students as a whole. Uh, really quickly, I wanna know why you chose virtual for your own uh, uh, children at home. Um, I'm sorry, say that last part. Why you opted why for you virtual choose? learning at home for your family? Okay, um, well, so my mom is staying with us um, and she is 69 years old and had a stroke a year and a half ago. And, and uh, we are just taking every precaution, which is difficult when you're running a statewide campaign also to take those precautions taking every precaution to try to keep um, her and my family safe. Um, Texans are struggling so much right now. And, and I recognize, you know, anytime I want to feel, throw myself a pity party, I immediately correct myself because most people have it so much worse. A, a, a lot of people don't have the flexibility to do virtual learning. A lot of people don't have the flexibility to do so much of their work on Zoom um, and, and aren't spending as much time at home. There are essential frontline workers who are keeping our country running. Um, there are small business owners that are out trying to survive through the pandemic. Um, you know, I chose that because 
we, because we could, and I would like more people, more parents to be able to make those choices. And that's why I'm advocating for things like sick leave. I don't think um, that people should, if they're feeling sick, feel like they have to show up to work um, and, and infect other people in the in, in, in middle of a, a, an airborne pandemic. Um, protections, PPE for frontline workers, things like that. But let me just back up on education real quick. Um, I've been, you know, a, a strong advocate for education. It's also why I'm so passionate about those down ballot candidates, those state house races that we really need. Um, you know, people like James Tallarico, uh, who's one of the best state representatives, and he's young, and he's a teacher, and he has a bright future, and and he's being uh, just, uh, just hatefully attacked with so many lies and propaganda about defunding the police and things like that. It's, it's terrifying to to see the breakdown of our democracy like this, but. Um, we have to protect education. I'm a proud product of public education. Um, I believe that we need to support teachers and, and invest in public schools that you shouldn't be able to predict your success by your zip code. Um, our, our schools are more than centers of education though. They're also places of social interaction. I have a little extrovert that, you know, we're, we're trying to find creative ways to keep him with, you know, not feeling isolated. Um, there are places for nutrition. There are places for um, you know, screening of abuse. A lot of um, domestic violence is caught in schools. And, and, and I just think we need to listen to teachers. We need to listen to public health experts. We need to listen to parents. When John Cornyn said in July, quote, we're not sure if kids can catch or spread COVID, there were already 1,700 positive cases of kids with COVID in Texas. So we just, y'all, we just need people who are going to be informed, who are going to listen to science and public health experts, make their decisions based on what's best for our state and not spread, you know, misleading information just because it's politically convenient. MJ, thank you very much. We just got kind of word that um, your campaign has just emailed us or texted. That's us. what I was distracted by. I'm so, so let's do this. We're going to get you off on time um, in a few more minutes, but if you're done, we're just going to kind of speed up the questions a little bit. Sure. And, I'll, I'll try uh, to keep it concise. Yeah. Uh, let's just talk about immigration, just very quickly. Your immigration, what you're looking at, what does this country need? Um, I believe our immigration system is broken. Um, when Mitch McConnell asked John uh, McCain to put together a bipartisan group to look at immigration, he specifically declined to allow John Cornyn on the team because he has sabotaged and voted against bipartisan immigration reform time and time and time and time again partly because of all the money, he is one of the top donors, recipients of uh, private detention centers, okay? Um, our immigration system right now is such a threat to our national security. Um, I believe that we are at risk of losing our, our position as leaders of the free world. We need comprehensive immigration reform, more in line with American values, representing the dignity of human life. We need to treat asylum seekers from our southern border the same way we treat asylum seekers from other countries. We need to resource our asylum courts, make sure that we properly process those asylum applications. We need to stop feeding the violence epidemic south of our border through the quarter of a million weapons that we traffic south of our border every year. Um, and you know, we need to protect dreamers. We need to um, immediately end family separation. Uh, and I think we need to end private prisons and detention centers. But there's a lot we need to do, but I'm trying to keep it short for you, JR. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Along with that, we're looking at, we're talking about rebuilding Texas and our strong economy. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that we lack, it's a labor force. Now in Texas and, a, and in a lot of states, labor force has been dependent on workers coming in from Mexico or other countries, documented, mm -hmm. undocumented, don't have time to get into that. But what is your solution when we're looking at, everybody wants secure borders, but we also need that labor force coming in because we don't have enough people to build and meet the needs that we need, whether it be in the building industry, some of the shrimping industry, some of the slaughterhouses, and some of the fields and the, and the agriculture, we don't have enough people in the fields or out in the, out in the oceans working. How, would, we, how would, you, would you address that? So I spent three years working for the Counter Drug Task Force. I know that a physical wall is not the answer, especially when it's gonna rob land from landowners in, in Texas and rob the, you know, the military construction budget, but um, it's not effective. Um, when we were working counter drug, we know that drugs are coming through, um, and I know we're talking about immigration, but I'm using it as an example, um, are coming through ports of entry over air, over water. I mean, it's just ridiculous to think that a physical wall is the answer. It's, it's a really bad symbol, by the way, for the leaders of the free world too. And it puts us with the likes of uh, Berlin and, and, and China, and, and, and I just don't think it's an answer. Um, what is the answer is um, we 
protect our national security through correct policies handed down to our, you know, Border Patrol and law enforcement. Uh, there is a culture of cruelty that is, I don't place the blame on the Border Patrol agents. I place the blame on the policies that they're being asked to implement, like zero tolerance and family separation and things like that. So better leadership, better policies down to law enforcement, um, investment in information and technology and training. Um, and, you know, we just, the, the answers are there. I'm not smarter than the people who have already put the work together to build the broad bipartisan coalitions of, of immigration reform that have been gutted and, and sabotaged by people like John Cornyn, but I would support those. And I think that we need a process for worker visas and, and, and things like that, and just make sure that we um, insist that people, if they want to be um, standing up for national security, and, and trying to stop illegal immigration, that that is very different than the actual anti-immigration policies and rhetoric of this administration. Okay. Really quickly, oh, go ahead, JR. No, go ahead, and then I have, I have a follow-up. Really quickly, gun control issues. I think this is gonna be something people, especially here in Texas, uh, means near and dear to our hearts. You know, you're against the open carry, you defend the constitution. Where exactly do you land? Explain how your stance really yeah. benefits um, your platform. Um, yeah, so I am a gun owner. Um, I'm a combat veteran. I own five firearms. I am an advocate for our Second Amendment. I believe that this, the gun violence epidemic is the greatest threat to our Second Amendment. And I believe that open carry activists that storm state capitals and demand um, action on certain things and um, that, that those that that situation and culture is a greater threat to our Second Amendment rights. 80% of our state wants universal background checks. Um, I support universal background checks. I support um, ERPOs, uh, extreme risk protection orders. I am also aware that the government has used gun safety during the civil rights movement to oppress people who had different political views than them. So I am going to be a watchdog protecting the second amendment and watching for government overreach. But we've been sold this false choice, just like in immigration, we have to choose between committing human rights violations and treating people without dignity and protecting our national security? No, we don't. We can do both. We've done both before and we can do both. I believe the same thing with guns. Um, you know, I believe we can protect our second amendment and protect our kids and do something about the gun violence epidemic. Um, I stand with organizations across the state uh, that, that are advocating for that and, um, you know, responsible gun ownership, safe storage, things like that are, are what I'm fighting for. MJ, I saw on your website that um, your, your position on gun ownership, but also that you're opposed to open carry. So how do you, you explain that to us? You're for the Constitution, you want to defend it, but yet yep. you're open carry, and then we'll have one more question after that, and then we'll be, we'll be cut you loose. Yeah, open carry isn't anywhere in the Constitution. Um, so, you know, I, I am against open carry because um, I think you should be able to have firearms in your vehicle. Um, I think if you want to concealed carry that that's fine, but open carry has become, maybe it wasn't always, but open carry has become an assault on bystanders, a way to intimidate people at the polls and elsewhere. Um, and it has been abused by open carry advocates who have turned it into a way to make people feel unsafe. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I have talked to gun owners across the state, not just supporters, but actually gone in and talked with groups of, 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 of Texans and um, you know, there are not that many people who, I think that the, the people who advocate for open carry are a minority, but they are a loud minority. Um, and we need to be more respectful of the, um, of the mainstream. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be endorsed by the Brady campaign and Giffords and Moms Demand Action, all of whom advocate for very mainstream, low hanging fruit gun safety legislation um, that, you know, when I, I have to repeat 80% of Texans to include 65% of Trump voters, by the way, in Texas want universal background checks. So why don't 80% of our legislators want universal background checks because they are listening to the gun lobby and not us. That's all I'm trying to say. Last question. And I wish we had more time. Um, as we're, as we're looking at the, um, as we're looking at the growing population in Texas, and if you were to be elected, you would represent a state that is soon to be, if not already after this census, over 50% Hispanic. Mm -hmm. The fact that Hispanics don't historically vote in large numbers and the fact that we have all kinds of issues with immigration and border and status and everything else, how would you effectively represent and make sure that Latinos from the state of Texas had a proportional voice in Washington? Well, I have mentioned the Constitution a few times. Um, one of the things called for in the Constitution is counting everybody in the census. 
The other thing in the Constitution that gets spit on all the time is the co-equal branches of government providing checks and balances on each other. So I am personally offended that our legislators haven't held our executive branch accountable for trying to not count a lot of the Latinos and Hispanics in state like, states like Texas. So, um, you know, how would I represent? I would come to meetings like this. I mean, John Cornyn hasn't decided to come. I would keep coming to meetings like this and hearing from groups like yours, uh, taking that input. My leadership style, and I know I have to run, my leadership style is such that um, I, don't, I don't think my job is to go to DC and speak for everybody. Okay, my job is to gather experiences, gather solutions, gather voices, and take those voices with me and present them in DC. And I don't see enough of that type of representative leadership. So thank you guys so much for having me on today. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry, uh, and my healthcare answer was super long, but it really is the number one thing facing our state. I kind of like to do a whole hour on, on, uh, on healthcare and how it's impacting small businesses. Um, but thank you guys so much for all that you're doing and for tuning in and giving me a chance to talk to y'all today. Please okay, go thank vote. You Thank you for joining us, Sanjay. All right, take care. Bye, y'all. All right, um, we cut it a little short, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Pauline, are you still on the line? Um, Chairman Guzman, if you're there, Kevin, on the back end, if you can kind of put a, maybe give us a panel discussion. Um, Pauline, do um, you want to go ahead and, and um, wrap it up, or you want me to do that? You go right ahead, sir. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, this has been brought to you by TAMAC, the Texas Association of Mexican-American Chambers of Commerce. We're a 45-year-old organization here in Texas, and a lot of people don't realize it, but Hispanic, Hispanic Chambers of Commerce actually started in Texas. Almost 90 years ago, the first uh, three Hispanic uh, chambers were going to be Corpus Christi, San Antonio, and Dallas. TAMAC formed about 45 years ago, and ever since then, we've been advocating for the, uh, for the rights, uh, to, to be a voice in the Texas legislature, whenever for small businesses. Now, just so you know, just because you're not Hispanic doesn't mean you can't be a part of our organization. A lot of people ask, why do you still go by TAMAC or the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce? Folks, we have a 45 year old brand. You'll see a lot of us times making a reference to TAMAC, but we, we're inclusive of everybody, whether you're, whether you're Mexican American, Cuban, Puerto Rican, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, also, if you're, um, if you're Anglo, African-American, Asian, we want you to be a part of our organization. You'll find that with TAMAC, a lot of our focus is going to be small to medium-sized businesses. That's the backbone of this country, small to medium-sized businesses. We have workshops, we have learning opportunities, we have seminars, we have conventions uh, to, to adhere to that. So we're here to, to help whenever way we can. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least uh, reintroduce or let her say some closing words. And then Mr. Chairman, if you wanna stand by, you can go ahead and wrap it up. But to my co-host for the first time working with us, Tamak did an excellent job. Uh, Tyana, come, come back and say hello real quick. It is an honor just you know, to be invited and to be included in the conversation of representative of Tamak to really shine bright and let people know that we are a growing, especially a younger, uh, more diverse and populous organization. We really are looking for our young entrepreneurs, our small business owners, the go-getters of those communities to join forces with us because it will only benefit us all tenfold. So I appreciate not only being invited to this uh, discussion today, but also to be recognized and be a part of Tamak. I think it's an incredible organization. Um, getting our voters, uh, people out there to the polls is really what we need to be educated and and be informing and also having those discussions locally at home and your own communities is so important right now. So I appreciate you allowing me to be part of this one. You are quite welcome and thank you. President Antone, any closing words? Just greatly appreciate not only uh, MJ for coming on to be able to hear from a candidate. We're looking forward to hearing from Mr. Cornyn or, or Senator Cornyn as well. Uh, but for all of those who attended and at the last moment, and I apologize for sending it out so late, but we greatly appreciate you being here. Ms. Taina, Mr. JR, we appreciate all of your comments. Y'all kept it lively and kept it going, and that is difficult to do, but y'all did an amazing job. Here at Tamak, we are pivoting just like all of you have, and we will be bringing a lot more of these to you. And please do not hesitate. You have my email, you have my cell phone number, you have everything. Contact me. Let me know on what you would like to hear. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Chairman Guzman, any closing comments, sir? I wanted to say that uh, uh, this was also a great uh, session. Uh, we started out uh, the, the sessions and, and a series of sessions that we're already planning. 
And as uh, uh, Pauline said, send us your ideas. But make, send us your ideas that impact the whole community uh, at large, because uh, obviously we have a lot of personal issues, but something that, that impacts the whole community at large, if you will. But I'll close by saying, wear your mask, keep your distance, be safe, and go vote. Thank you. Absolutely, go vote. The polls are already open. Uh, you have your choice. Um, this has been brought to you by TAMAC, the Texas Association of Mexican-American Chambers of Commerce, to better inform you on what's going on around the state so you can be better informed as you cast your vote. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining our seminar. And be going to our website, watch our website. We also have a Facebook page for upcoming events.